Welcome to Breakthrough Success. I'm your host, Mark Aberti, the content marketing expert, bringing you five new episodes every week where I and top level guests teach you how to take your business to the next level and achieve your breakthrough. Hello, Breakthrough Success sisters. I just wanted you all to know before the episode actually starts, I've been working a little bit behind the scenes to give you something really special. So a while ago, I wrote my book, Content Marketing Secrets, which helps people create, promote, and optimize their content for growth and revenue. And I just put the finishing touches together to offer that for free to anyone who is interested. So if you want your free copy of Content Marketing Secrets, all you have to do is head over to markgaberti.com slash book. Now, let's jump right into the episode. One of the things that we all have to do as business owners is get as many customers for our brands as possible. But what happens after someone becomes a customer? This is very critical. We have to become a little more customer centric with our approach because if we focus on customer acquisition, but we're not treating our customers right, that's not going to lead to good word of mouth. That's going to lead to a lot of bad things. But if we do have a customer centric focused business, that's going to lead to a lot of really awesome results. So we're going to focus on how to build that kind of a business and integrate that with your existing model. So today's guest is the general manager of the service hub at HubSpot. And he helps scale the support and success teams of many businesses ranging from startups to a publicly traded SAAS juggernaut. He turns HubSpot's customer support team from a cost center to a profit center and one of HubSpot's greatest engines of growth. He is a noted writer, speaker, and leader who is joining us today to help us re-envision what success looks like for our businesses. Today's guest for episode 236 of the Breakthrough Success Podcast is none other than Michael Redboard. Michael, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks so much, Mark. That was an awesome introduction. I'm really, really psyched to be here. Talk about how we learned a couple things at HubSpot, talk about customers, and talk about growth. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Michael, I'm really looking forward to this interview as well. I mean, you've been involved with HubSpot. I really like the uh, customer-centric approach, and this is something that I know we need to talk about because you could spend so much time acquiring customers, but the customer centricity is uh, taking your business to the next level. So we'll talk about that. I'd like to get some background first. So uh, can you talk a little bit about how you got involved in HubSpot and also a little bit of what you're doing to help HubSpot continue to grow? Yeah, sure. So I, I've been with HubSpot since we were sort of a little baby uh, company, right? So we're a pretty good story of growth. Nowadays, we're a publicly traded SaaS company, like we're relatively sizable, and things have gone well. Uh, when I started, you know, eight years ago, that really wasn't the case. We were relatively small. It was a struggle uh, to sign up every customer, to make our product work, to get every customer successful, and you know, think things were not quite so easy. So when I joined HubSpot, it was I think around um, you know 80 folks, and we were just like we, we were acquiring customers at a pretty rapid pace. And one of the things we learned quickly was that, you know, we needed to deliver a top-notch service post-sale, right? And I think that's something that a lot of businesses discover as they grow. You make a big promise to win the sale, then delivering on it actually is, of course, more challenging than you thought. Even if you thought it was going to be challenging, it ends up being more challenging. And so my, my career at HubSpot what I really enjoy doing with lots of companies of all sizes is helping them to meet their, those aspirations they have for customers, helping them like mature their operation. Um, that's exactly what I did at HubSpot. So I ran our support team, like you said earlier, when it was really small, grew that to about 10 exercise, you know, hired hundreds of people, really, really grew it significantly, um, and then went on to lead our entire post sale organization, which is much closer to the revenue. Um, you know, that involves terms like customer success, uh, sort of the long term outcomes of customers, the renewals, all of that, along with support. Um, and that was really one of my, you know, uh, kind of very happy moments was to be able to look after our customers at HubSpot end to end and make sure their experiences did meet the aspirations that we had for them. And nowadays what I do is I, I make software uh, that sort of takes some of those learnings that we've had from that era and all of those mistakes that we made and solutions that we created. And now we're making software that's going to help hopefully millions of businesses sort of grow better uh, with their customers as a result. And I really like the, uh, like, you got started when it was relatively small and, like, a lot of orders were coming in. And you mentioned how you have to live up to the promise. And that is something where uh, it can be challenging. And it's always good to overestimate the 
amount of challenge because then it helps you to understand you're going to have to put in a lot of effort towards living up to the promises you give to your customers. And we're talking about having a, like a customer centric business, but um, I wonder if we go a little deeper into that. And so what do you believe a successful customer centric uh, strategy looks like? Yeah, I think I think one way to sort of a good uh, litmus test for this, right, is sort of where you spend your airtime in, inside your company. When you sit around the table and you have a chat about your company and how things are going, how much does the word customer show up? If you were to transcribe the conversation, right, does it show up a lot or a little? Is it once or is it a hundred times, right? Like how much of, that, uh, of the charts that you look at on a you know week to week or month to month basis about your business have to do with your customers or is it all about marketing and sales and other stuff, right, Del delivery or something like that? And so you think about the airtime as a good witness test. Now, that's the way w when I talk to a business, I sort of am able to quickly gauge whether or not they're sort of a quote unquote customer centric organization and if they have that like kind of thinking. And by the way, that wisdom test applies to a really small company, even if it's just a one person or two people and all the way up to a big company where you can sit in a board meeting, look at their board slides and understand, you know, the way they operate. So that's the litmus test. The question is, how does a company kind of get there? And some are probably born with it, right? You're just sort of naturally very customer centric. And maybe they're just have really empathetic founders or their product or the way they work is somehow like, you know, really um, customer ingrained, let's call it. But for most businesses, the the business starts off as a pretty sales focused operation. When you're really small and you want to grow, you need to go out into the market, you need to make some noise in marketing, and you need to close that business uh, in sales. And then sort of that becomes the focus because that's the primary driver of growth. And for a lot of small and fast growing businesses, they actually end up very uncustomer centric. They don't give a lot of airtime to customers because of that, because they're spending so much time on sales and marketing trying to grow. At a certain point though, the reality starts to sink in. And the reality is that if you don't make your customers sort of successful, you're not able to create repeat customers, that the cost of getting a new customer and going back to the pond each time and trying to go fishing for a new one, that that is going to not work in your favor on the long term, right? And so there's this realization that happens to these kinds of businesses, which I think is really most businesses, that you know acquisition and that focus is really useful kind of in the, in the beginning, but it pretty quickly requires you to move to a more balanced approach where you solve for the customer and you solve for the acquisition sort of at the same time inside your company. And that's when the airtime starts to change. That's when the focus starts to change. That's why I see a lot of companies kind of grow up in a lot of ways. And you mentioned the uh, sales and marketing, which like if you focus on that for too long and you have so many customers, um, like you're, you got to keep fishing in that pond, as you mentioned before. I really like that uh, analogy, but I'm wondering like, I know you touched upon this a little bit, but I'm wondering if you could go into a little more detail about how to balance sales and marketing with uh, serving our customers. Yeah. So, right, if I uh, get into a little bit of math here. Sure. Is that kosher? All right, let's do it. So let's imagine you have a certain amount of money that you can use to go fishing in the pond, right? That you can use to do acquisition. Okay. And say you've got, let's just pick some round numbers. You've got a uh, hundred bucks for US listeners, hundred dollars. Okay. And you know, you can go out in, into the pond and you can acquire, um, you can acquire customers and you want to grow. Right? And so say you have 10 customers and 100 bucks to acquire. And of those 10, you know, a certain number of them are going to be repeat customers, but a certain number of them aren't. So let's imagine that, you know, let's say three of them are going to leave you and you go from 10 to 7. You need to now spend some of your budget, some of that $100, as just a replacement effect, right? Just to get back up to the 10 because you went from 10 to 7. Now you need to add the three back in to sort of refill, um, you know, the size of uh, your business, right? If you're from a one month or to the next month, right? And so that acquisition budget, right, that hundred bucks is pretty valuable money and you want to use it to grow, but you actually have to use it to have a replacement effect to, you know, have customers kind of coming back to you um, if, if they're not, right? And so what that means is that over time, if you're constantly spending that acquisition money just to kind of get your head back above water, we're using a lot of um, sort of uh, aquatic analogies here, <laughs> but if you're, using, if you're using that money just to get back to, uh, to the to the kind of high tide line there, that's actually going to be very, very challenging. It's going to stunt your ability to grow. And so at a certain point, when you get bigger and your budget doesn't expand linearly with the size of your customer base, right, um, it becomes really, really smart to take some of that budget that you use for acquisition and actually use it for kind of long-term customer happiness, remarketing, right, uh, customer support, whatever it is that gets folks to kind of stick with you so you're losing less each period. And so what you can do is take your acquisition budget, right, say it's 100 bucks, and if you can divert some of that money 
from sales and marketing to customer success, customer support, customer marketing, whatever it is, and actually get a more efficient return on it, right? Because that acquisition money, it just gets harder and harder to get that next best placement in organic or that next, you know, ad click or whatever it is. The incremental cost goes up, but you can actually get more mileage out of that in a lot of ways by investing in your customer base and providing, you know, that one better experience, that one better, you know, service moment or something like that. So I find that a lot of businesses, once they realize the math behind this, like constantly pouring money into acquisition maybe isn't the only way. There's this other way where you can do acquisition and customer stuff. Then they say, oh, I actually have two levers in my business I can pull. And that's when they begin to turn the corner, make the change to a much more customer-centric business because it starts to make dollars. So it starts to make sense too. And I mean, it, like, it does make sense from like a revenue standpoint, especially as your business grows. And that's just the point of getting more and more, but preserving what you have. Because if you get like five new customers, but you lose 10 of your existing customers, you're at a net loss of five customers. So uh, the math really does uh, show that in the long term, it is very powerful to have a customer centric strategy. You mentioned the power of having repeatable customers. Uh, like if you care about your customer success and they become successful, when you say repeatable business, do you mean that um, someone like buys one of your products, they buy another one of your products, or is it a membership or is it a combination of both? It's a combination. It, it can really actually range quite a bit depending on the business itself. So let me let me take it like one example that I recently, uh, recently had. So I was in Denver, Colorado um, for a bachelor party in – uh, let's see, April, right? And then I was back for a conference in June. And we stayed at this hotel um, that actually handled our our group really well. I thought they just did a great job. Uh, we had sort of complicated booking situations, lots of people, weird times. I didn't even go to TripAdvisor and like look for a different hotel to stay. I went right back to that hotel in Denver, right? It's called the Maven Hotel. And, uh, and I had a great time second time too. And so for them, the cost of acquiring me that second time was way lower, and that that was in a, that was a rebooking, right? So that's one example in the hospitality industry, and I think that applies to restaurants and stuff too. It's very hard to get a new, um, you know, person in the door, but once you actually get them in once, it becomes easier if the experience is good. Now, for a different type of company that maybe sells like office supplies, right? And you're selling, uh, you know, pen, pens and paper, right? It's likely that that office also needs things like boxes of tissues and erasers and notebooks, right? Of course, right? And so if, if you're able to deliver a good experience on top of pens and paper, which are, to be honest, a relatively commodified uh, object, right? Then maybe there's an adjacency, a different product that you can sell. That's kind of the second way. Then the third way I would say is, is in a more recurring revenue kind of subscription-based business. It's just folks kind of staying with you. That recurring revenue over time becomes a really lucrative, uh, very, very profitable source of revenue, right? In somebody's, you know, second year or third year with you, once you kind of paid off the acquisitions cost. And so for any kind of recurring revenue, subscription-based business, that's what I mean, I guess, by keeping your customers a repeat business. And I'm really happy you gave a lot of examples because like the hotel one is one that a lot of people can relate to. And you also have people who, like some of them are just selling individual products, books, training courses, trying to get repeat buyers. You have other people with a membership uh, subscription kind of service. So uh, I just wanted to touch on that. And one of the things that I also want to touch on, this is something that this is one of your quotes. You say that um, <clears throat> the hard truth about marketing is that nothing you create is as powerful as what your customers say. And we have that word of mouth factor. We see this with Amazon reviews being so important for determining like whether someone buys a product or not, friend recommendations, things like that. So how can we get our customers to voice out their thoughts about our brands, especially yeah. the good ones? Yeah, I mean, I've got a bunch of thoughts on this, but I would actually just, I want to just call it listeners' attention to a conversation we just had like two minutes ago, right? When I gave an example of this hotel thing that I had personally had an experience with. Like, I gave the name of the hotel back there, right? They actually just got some advocacy out of me Right to the listeners of this show, they probably didn't plan on it, but through good experiences, they they get the sort of virality kind of effect, right? So I, I would offer that just doing a really good job <laughs> and producing really good product can, in and of itself, create word of mouth. Right? So I think that's like the first thing that businesses need to do is you know make sure that they're delivering excellent experiences, excellent products, that they're following through on their promises, all of that, and delivering just a sufficiency of quality there actually can set you apart from the market because so many people have so many bad experiences uh, with, with your competitors likely. So that's number one is just do a really good job at the thing that you do. 
Number two, I think that you can you can think about is making sure that there's a way, a sort of obvious way for your customers as a business to create repeat purchase cycles, right? So if you're a subscription business, it's really easy because next month and the month after they want to keep getting uh, whatever it is that you're selling. But if you're selling like an online training course or a one-off thing, right, what's the way that a customer could even have a repeat purchase cycle, right? And I think you need to make sure that you have that. That involves creating multiple products or looking at your adjacencies and partnering with other folks or creating some way they can kind of capitalize on this effect, right? So make do a great job, then make sure that actually like you have the path to re repeatable uh, purchases sort of in place. And then the third thing I would say is that once you can figure out, you know, that you have that, how do you take customers that have really good experiences, identify them, and then make sure that you enable them to kind of do that virality game for you, right? And so that really involves getting into a conversation with your customers, understanding their feedback, who are the people that are really happy, who are the people that aren't, by the way, can we fix it? And for those that are really happy, who wants to actually be your advocate? And then taking them and saying, look, here's some offers for you that we can we can do. And there's repeat purchase offers, right? You, you get all these, these all the time via email or something, where it's like, hey, thanks for buying this, take 30% off your next purchase or whatever it is. There's lots of different ways, depending on the nature of your business, that you can make that flywheel spin faster. But if you don't know who those best customers are, and there's no way for them to actually take that next step to spend more with you, it's actually very, very tricky to get this whole machine working. So if you just sell one product, it can be tricky if there's no repeat purchase cycle to actually get happy people who want to rebuy and get this whole flywheel going. And one of the things that I want to point out is you talked about uh, the good customers, you talked about making them advocates, but you also talked about the people who didn't have a good experience and you want to uh, help them um, maybe en enhance their experience or see what went wrong because usually those people are a lot more vocal. That's why like towards the end I mentioned like how do we like get good customers to uh, be vocal because like the ones who had a bad experience, they tend to be a little more vocal. So it's actually good to go to them and see how you can better their experience or right the wrong that happened. So I really do like that approach. And one of the things I also want to ask is like a customer centric strategy. It's not something that everybody is focusing on. It's something that some people may start to be thinking about as they uh, get a lot of acquisitions and then they find themselves in this game where like they get two new customers, they lose two customers and they're pretty much uh, level. So I'm wondering what do you believe holds most people back from having a customer centric business? Mm. I think it's just very, very hard to turn the corner from being a real acquisition focused business to a customer focused business because the 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 day to day of what you think about, like where you spend your energy is just very different, right? And so in an acquisition based world, it, it's about like like scale and size. And we need to get more leads. It's always about more, more, more. We need more leads in, right? We need to grow our email list. We need to improve the conversion rate from, from one place to another, right? And so it's all about size. And in that, in that conversation about size, there's a mindset where it's not about perfection, right? It's just about scale. And the more you do, the better your outcomes go with a bigger funnel, the more folks you get in, right? And there, there is some conversion rate optimization stuff that happens, of course, and you want to, you know, improve the conversion rate of your email list to fail or whatever it is. But it's never about perfection, never about getting 100% of those people on the email to buy because that's just unrealistic. In a customer-centric world, it is about 100%. It's about making every single customer successful. There cannot be any broken eggs, essentially, right? And so it's a very, very different mindset to go from a funnel-based kind of thinking where you're saying, oh, we're just going to get a ton of people in and some of them are going to kind of sift out and that's where we're going to see our success to where we're saying, oh, no, no, this isn't a funnel. This is something that we need to like just this needs to be kind of perfect, right? We need every customer to have a good experience and then kind of feed back that energy into the top of the funnel and kind of bend that whole uh, analogy, say, no, it's not a funnel anymore, it's a flywheel. It's just a very, very different way to spend your time and your energy, right? So instead of then saying, look, we need to grow the size of the list, you look at your failure rate of folks who say, give you feedback where they're not happy. And you sort of identify that, you start bucketing it, and you get really, really detailed into the, the nitty gritty of your customer experience. Very different mindset, I think, a very different way to spend your day. And that's what I think a lot of people have a challenge with when they start to make this transition, um, is that it really requires a different set of skills often a different set of human beings to execute that work. Somebody with a really, really great sales mindset uh, doesn't always make the best kind of customer leader. And it's interesting you point out it's an entirely different mindset and you have that uh, funnel analogy and you uh, it basically flipped it on its head for um, when it comes to a customer-centric approach where you need to have a 100% success rate, which in a funnel, I mean, 
that's not really happening in a funnel because just based on how funnels are structured. So uh, like it's, it's a very different approach. I really like the comparison and uh, I mean, cust- like going from like acquisition to customer centric, it, it is a big shift as you mentioned before, it's a big challenge. And one of the things that I want to ask you is if you could share with us one big challenge that you have faced on your journey and a powerful lesson you learned during that challenge. Mm, let's see. So I, I think that as you make this type of change, right, um, one of the one of the hardest things is finding really good ways to measure how all this stuff works. And you want to know, okay, so you, you, you decide to call this play at your at your company, right? And you say, look, we're going to move from an acquisition-focused company to a customer-focused company. What does that mean? How do you measure that change? And we've talked a lot so far about mindsets and like, you know, listen to the conversations that are happening. But we actually needed a completely different set of metrics that we looked at in a completely different set of ways in order to make the change. And so, you know, we, we had to create um, a different, a new level of depth around customer experience, right? And we started to measure things um, that were both uh, kind of quantitative and obvious, like you know the percentage of customers that took a certain action with us or you know had a certain experience, but also that were a little squishier to call it like that, and were more sort of experiential based. And we got we we got a lot more survey centric. We started to really become students of like net promoter score and customer effort and things like that. And this, the the charts and graphs that we now look at at HubSpot in a more customer centric state are so so different than what we looked at back in the day. We always had some numbers about our customers because we needed to report out revenue to the board and investors, but we never got really really deep and super detailed on all that stuff. And so nowadays, one one thing we're very obsessive about to give you a really concrete example is. NPS, right? And NPS is not the cure-all for all of your customer ills, but simply asking folks, you know, how much would you recommend us is a really good gauge of that word of mouth. It's a really good gauge of that flywheel effect that we were talking about before. And further, gives you an avenue back to the folks that are unhappy and unhappy enough that they actually want to tell you about it. And then just through the action of following up with them, just through that interaction, right, back to that unhappy person, you actually can take action to improve your customer experience by having that conversation, by making that one thing better. And hopefully then that improves your word of mouth and everything else. So so we, we now spend a lot of time in MPS, but up front, a lot of it was really just about changing our, our lens. And I honestly think that took us probably two years. Like it was not a quick thing where we just slapped on a new set of chart templates and went for it. I mean, it took a long, long time. We, we kind of kept having to keep, keep digging until we felt comfortable with the degree to which we understood our customers. And you say it took two years to make that transition. Would you say it was two years because of the transition itself and what it entails, or is it because like HubSpot is such a big company where uh, it takes a little longer for stuff like this to go through? Yeah, so the, the period of time in which I would say we made this change, we, we were still a private company. We weren't we weren't that big. We probably a lot bigger than some of the listeners, but we weren't you know gigantic. Um, I think it really just had to do with the, the mindset change and the fact that we didn't know what we were doing. I, I, there's not a there's not a playbook for this that's like really easy. And every customer is different because every business is different, right? And to really understand what makes your customers happy, what drives their advocacy, like that's a very kind of personal for for the business. It's a very kind of personal, um, you know, set of numbers and things to measure. And so it just took us years to figure it out. Um, I don't think it had anything to do with scale. I think it's just a it's just a hard problem, and it's one you really have to grind away at. And I mean, it's something that uh, for some people it's easier than others, but overall it does have this big mindset shift where you're going from acquiring to uh, that customer centric approach, that main focus that uh, has been a critical part of this episode. And uh, one of the critical habits for anyone to develop is to read as many books as possible. And with that in mind, Michael, I'm wondering if you could share with us three books that you believe will have a positive impact on us. Sure. So um, I think there's one that's kind of, uh, I don't know, sort of seminal to this whole line of thinking, which is um, you know, the Zappos book, Delivering Happiness, right? I think that's still one of the best books about service um, that's out there and really adopting a service-based mindset um, to serve your customers. And a lot of that is about how to sort of react to their needs, create little moments of delight and stuff like that. Um, I think that that one's really solid. A slightly more, um, I think, uh, modern book. I think this Apple's book's been updated, but uh, with a, just a different line of thinking. Um, it's called The Messenger is the Message. It's by the CEO of Influitive, which is a customer advocacy software platform. And I think that this book is really great because, I mean, 
almost the lessons almost in the title. And I think you you said a quote earlier, Mark, uh, from me that you know your marketing can't outshout your customers, and it, the customer can be your best marketer. It, it, and so this book is largely about look, you can deliver the same message, say my company is great, but if it comes from you as the company, it's much less impactful than it comes from your customer. So the messenger is a message is another great one. Um, and then there, there's a. I'm gonna the third one. I'm actually gonna call out here um, is that uh, it's not a book, but it's a, it's an article. It's an HBR article, I believe, uh, written in 2010, and it was about the difference between customer delight um, and customer effort, right? And I think this is a really nice counterpoint to the Zappos book. And it says, look, it's not about delight. Don't try to create delight for everybody. That's too much effort, too much time, too much money. It's really about effort and how do you reduce customer effort at each stage of the game um, I'm a big kind of proponent of that and I said it earlier in terms of creating advocacy what do you need to do you need to actually deliver on what you said you need to do it repeatedly hundred percent of the time that's where a lot of my thinking on that topic comes from from that HBR article about customer effort Michael thank you for sharing with us those great book recommendations and the HBR article those will all be in the show notes marketbrit.com slash e236 we'll also throw in my book content marketing secrets in the show notes marketbrit.com slash book you get your free copy just pay for the shipping and before we wrap up this episode Michael I've asked you several questions throughout our time together but what do you believe is one question that we need to be asking ourselves more often I think it's what 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 percentage of the time that you focus on your business. Are you spending thinking about your customer experience as opposed to growing your business? What's the sort of, if there's a seesaw out there, what's the customer balance versus the enterprise balance? And I think that if you can really dial that in, understand that balance, you start to be able to get on this path for customer centricity, which is really just a better way to grow. Michael, thanks for sharing with us that great question. All of your great insights throughout our time together. Now, uh, for all listeners wondering uh, how they can keep up with Michael, he actually recommended that we just follow up with uh, HubSpot's newest product line, Service Hub, which is over at HubSpot.com slash service. That link will be in the show notes. But Michael, you want to give us a little like uh, lay of the land for what people are going to see when they click on that link? Yeah, so that, that's the link to our newest product line that I'm uh, sort of the proud parent of. Um, and, you know, like I said, we learned a lot at HubSpot over the years about how to do service right. Hopefully some of the things that we talked about today resonated with folks. This is a software platform uh, built on top of HubSpot to enable that, to enable you to, you know, organize your conversations with customers right, make sure you're meeting all their expectations, to allow self-service, to enable advocacy, to do all that kind of stuff. So check it out. And I'm also happy to kind of have today be the beginning of a conversation with the listeners. And uh, I'm available on Twitter, at Redboards, my last name, LinkedIn. Um, so happy to continue having the chats with you all. All right. Those links will all be in the show notes. But Michael, you've given us so much on how we can have a customer-centric approach, something that uh, is so important. Definitely a big transition, but something very important to do. So thank you for coming on Breakthrough Success today and sharing all of your great insights with us. Thanks so much, Mark. It's been an absolute pleasure being here. Uh, wish, wish all the listeners all the best today. How does over 100 retweets per day sound to you? My free ebook, 27 Ways to Get More Retweets on Twitter, has you covered. I use the methods within this ebook to get over 10,000 retweets every single quarter to learn. 